And so I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, Dean Eccles, uh, who took his degrees at Stanford, um, studying with Cliff Nass and others here, and uh, is now at Facebook. Uh, he studies social influence uh, using computational methods and is going to talk about uh, peer effects and feedback in online networks. Dean. Yeah, thanks, thanks Martha. Um, yeah, so um, probably as in the case with many of these talks, I'm going to cover a, a lot of material in a short time, but hopefully it'll be kind of provocative and interesting. So a lot of what I care about are functions like this, where um, uh, we have some number of somebody's peers, broadly considered, who choose to engage in some behavior, and then as a function of that, um, somebody decides whether or not to engage in maybe that same behavior. So uh, if your peers are quitting smoking, are you quitting smoking? If your peers uh, start uh, playing a particular uh, game on their phone, do you start playing that game also? So this is a, a causal and individual level function that we're interested in, this exposure adoption function. And uh, like the social sciences and uh, epidemiology tell us lots of things about what this function could look like. So actually, if you have a simple contagion model where each of your infected friends has an independent probability of infecting you, this is how a lot of contagious diseases work, then you get this blue line, the simple contagion line. It's always sublinear, right? So additional infected friends uh, basically give you the same or less increment in the probability of you being infected. That's very different than what we might get, what the economists and game theorists would tell us we could ha have happen, which is that um, we have something much more like a, a step function where um, there's some payoff that I get from adopting, say, a technology like fax machines, um, and that once my payoff is positive, um, then I will adopt the technology almost certainly. So once I have enough friends who are using fax machines, it's like, okay, now the benefit to me is high enough, therefore I'm gonna shell over the money for the fax machine. All right, so these are two very different models of how things can spread in networks, how people can affect each other. Um, and I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to tell you today which one of these applies to a whole list of different behaviors you might care about, but it's learning about these functions and then the consequences of having that knowledge about these functions uh, that I'm gonna talk a bit about. So the motivation from the perspective of, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist at Facebook, so I think a lot about how uh, people are interacting online and therefore affecting each other through the Facebook product. So here, you know, is the Facebook social network. Okay, the real one's slightly bigger than this. Um, but each one of these represents somebody's experience. Um, and they're all kind of networked together in some way because they have friends and they're affecting each other. So this is one of the reasons why you, you immediately want to care about peer effects. Uh, if you're trying to design an experience like Facebook. So often our number one goal in thinking about peer effects is just trying to estimate the peer effects themselves. What, how much does one marginal peer, one more friend adopting affect your probability of also adopting some behavior? Um, and so here the ideal experiment is something like directly assigning your peers to engage in some behavior. Um, and so that's sometimes what we're able to do, but even when you can't run the ideal experiment, it's often really useful to think about uh, what that would be. So, um, so I just want to give an example of something that can diffuse on Facebook that's kind of interesting. Oh, I guess we'll, we'll cut off a little bit. Hopefully we'll be fine. Um, okay, so this, it, this is a, um, a cascade of uh, a photo being reshared on Facebook. So somebody uploaded a, a public photo to Facebook, and actually this particular photo represents a rumor, uh, in particular that um, Obamacare uh, has this medical device tax that's part of it, that's true, um, and uh, that Cabela's was actually um, uh, showing this medical device tax on a bunch of people's receipts, right? So you know the, the meme was something like, that you know, Obamacare says it's supposed to be a hidden tax from consumers, but Cabela's is showing us the tax, um, and so it's like this you know substantial tax on like everything Cabela's is selling. So that was actually totally true. Cabela's was doing that, but it was computer error in which they applied a medical device tax that nothing Cabela's sells it would apply to. But it's this interesting rumor in that it's like sort of part true, part false, um, and this is the cascade of people resharing this one photo that somebody uploaded, which was a picture of a receipt from Cabela's with this information about it. And then we've shown in red the uh, the nodes where one one of the one of these people's friends probably who reshared this commented with a link to the website Snopes.com. Snopes 
is a website that tries to sort of arbitrate truth about urban legends. And so if you actually go to Snopes, they say that this is, that actually depending on what time you went there, they'd say that it's mixed or true uh, depending on uh, when actually you went. Um, so one of the things we can be interested in is how, if my friend shares a particular rumor on Facebook, how much, how much more likely does that make me to share it? And then what happens in this case of feedback, where I get potentially negative feedback and my friend saying, that's bull****, right? Like, that's not actually what uh, was going on. Or they say, oh, it's just more complicated, check Snopes. So one of the things you might see happening here, you could like squint and you know we try to do statistical analysis to figure this out, but you can also squint to this picture and say maybe a lot of these red nodes are leaves. They don't have this. They don't have children on here, right? So that perhaps actually getting snoped, having a friend comment linking to Snopes is actually like decreasing the spread of this rumor. I don't know, maybe there's also some that are like, you know have a lot of children, so maybe that's not true. But so that's what we set out to examine and taking a look at a corpus of rumors that we collected by finding all photo reshare cascades that had been snoped at some point in the much larger cascade. That allowed us to sort of collect a set of rumors that we know, or at least we have good reason to suspect, are about this particular rumor as represented on Snopes. Because it's a common thing for people to sort of link to this particular website, and this serves as a database of Snopes rumors. Um, so we thought this was an interesting way of asking a lot of questions about how things spread, especially rumors, and rumors that are classified in numerous ways, being about different topics, um, and also being true, false, or kind of maybe somewhere in between. Um, and so one of the things that we found that was interesting is actually that uh, these rumors, these, these cascades that we collected, end up having much, much greater depth than your average photo reshare cascade. So lots of things like public photos that people upload to Facebook, sometimes these produce large cascades. Like the biggest one I think that's occurred so far, some of my colleagues wrote about was the uh, Obama victory photo. Uh, it was reshared like crazy. But, you know, most of them are not reshared nearly that much. But these, these, re, these reshare cascades for the rumors are a bit deeper. So we're kind of seeing um, longer cascades, maybe not as wide, but longer cascades um, of these rumors. So we wanted to ask a lot of questions about that. In particular, um, what, what might make this spread re more responsive to the truth of the rumor, right? So um, are there like features of the network, especially the feedback processes on Facebook, just through social feedback, that could help uh, you know, true rumors continue to spread as, as false rumors are maybe abated a little bit by the injection of external information? So one thought is that when your friend snopes your reshare, maybe you'll consider uh, reconsider propagating it. Maybe after now that I've read that link they posted, I'm not so confident that I want to attach my name to this and share it on to other people. So one of the things that we find is that, yeah, if your friend does uh, snope your reshare of some rumor, um, that this does result in a, in a substantially higher deletion rate for false rumors. Here's actually a, pl a plot of... Um, all the relatively popular rumors in this data set indicated by whether they're false, true, or maybe somewhere in between. And so, um, and then on the y-axis is basically how, how much more likely they are to be deleted if you get snoped, if someone links to the Snopes <laughs> article. Right, because certainly you would think, okay, if, if somebody, if I post this and then somebody links to the Snopes article that says that it's true, that's usually not going to induce me to delete it. I'm now actually like sort of feeling good about what I've, what, <laughs> what I've posted here. Um, actually, it turns out that in some cases, people do um, uh, want to uh, delete uh, false or, or uh, sorry, true or maybe rumors, just because they learn more about this maybe being out, to, out of date. So um, they learn that, that actually this rumor, yeah, it's true what I posted, but I'm kind of late to the show, right? So this is something that happened two years ago. Um, but by and large, the, this, this external e injection of external information by peers does kind of stem this uh, spread of these false rumors. So he, here I've just highlighted uh, three rumors that uh, sort of stand out in being really affected by people uh, saying, that, um, uh, saying that, hey, here's the, here's the link to this rumor on Snopes. That Cabela's medical device tax one I highlight. Uh, at the time that we did this, actually, um, 
uh, Snopes classified it as true, even though sort of only part of it is true, which is that yes, Obamacare does have this medical device tax, and Cabela's is charging people the tax, but they weren't supposed to. But uh, so that's one of the reasons why it stands out as being this really highly deleted rumor. So this is kind of the example of some of the behaviors that these feedback processes and pure effects matter for. Um, and so then I want to highlight some, some other aspects of how we learn about pure effects. One of the challenging things in looking at this is we say, okay, this is the difference in probability of deletion if, if your story gets snoped or not. But who are the type of people who have friends who will actually post these links to Snopes? Maybe they're also people who are more likely to uh, delete their posts, etc. So that's one of the challenges that we have in doing causal inference, trying to learn about cause and effect when studying peer influence, is that people's friends, when they engage in particular behavior, that often says something about that person. Not because their friends are necessarily causing them to do something, but it reveals latent traits. Like, as we say, birds of a feather flock together. So a lot of times we try to do experiments to learn about this. So, you know, one thing that Facebook uh, has uh, is social advertising. This is sort of a broader trend. Social advertising here we define as advertising that uses some information about consumer social networks for two, pur for two purposes. One is to target advertisements because the network encodes information because of this latent homophily. Because birds of a feather flock together, if your friend is interested in something, this says that you might also be interested in it because it reveals some of your otherwise unobserved traits. But also because social advertisements can include personalized social cues. That is, the ad can explicitly state that your friend has affiliated themselves with some brand or expressed an affiliation with a brand in a particular way. And that can be persuasive. So we try to distinguish those two things by running an experiment. So here's an experiment that we did. I think earlier Byron uh, Reeves talked a little bit about, you know, don't worry about getting so many users. Uh, we, we ended up with a bunch of users anyway. Uh, in this experiment, but um, so here, here are the two treatments. Uh, this is an old ad unit. Uh, this is not an ad unit on Facebook anymore, but it's actually sort of the lightest touch social ad you could have. So on the left, we have this ad for the History Channel and um, an encouragement to, to connect with the History Channel brand on Facebook. Uh, and then it says just this general social cue information implementation of something like social proof, like what Mauritz is talking about, 300,000 people like this. And on the right hand side we say, oh, actually, your specific friend likes this. And so um, not everyone can we show this one on the right to, because they may not have a friend who likes the History Channel. But for those people that we can show that personalized social cue to, we can decide not to randomly, and instead show them this generic social cue. And so that's what we did. And this is actually one of my kind of favorite ways to run an experiment, is where the entire experiment consists of a change to small light gray text on a white background, right? So basically we have the same number of non-white pixels here. I mean, now nowadays the social ads on Facebook have a lot more sort of social to them. This is a very, very, um, very minimal indicator that your friend is associated with this brand. So um, here are the results of this experiment, looking at the normalized like rate. How many of the people who see this ad go on actually to like that page? Um, for people who have one, two or three friends who actually do like the page. And then we decide to either show one of those friends selected at random or zero of those friends. So across the board, we see actually that there's not only what, even if you don't show the friend's name at all, we get an increase in the like rate as you have more friends who are associated with the page. Because remember, if you have more friends who are associated with, with for example, in that example, the History Channel, um, maybe this says something about you, that perhaps you might be more likely to be a history buff yourself and like the page. Um, and then also that if we do show the friend's name, this has an effect as well. So this highlights both the targeting component of the social network and also the persuasion component of the social network. So that's, that's sort of how, in the ideal case, when you can run this kind of experiment where there's some channel by which social influence occurs, by which these pure effects occur. And you can sort of turn off that channel sometimes to show a little bit less social information. Uh, this is what you can learn about how pure effects function. A lot of times, we're interested in something slightly different um, when we're caring about pure effects. 
is that we have some new version of something that we're interested in the effects of. So you have um, you have video chat. We have a new you know video chat option. I think Facebook already has video chat, but you can imagine we have yet to launch that. We want to know what would happen if we gave everyone this new treatment. But these people are all interacting with each other. So the normal approach of just sort of uh, you know putting a coin on everyone and flipping it, and we get an A/B test seems somehow not so helpful. I mean, this guy has video chat, but none of his friends have video chat. So who's he chatting with, right? So if we're trying to learn about what happens when you and all your friends and all their friends have video chat, um, this isn't really sufficient. So uh, the ideal experiment would be if we just had completely disconnected components of the network, we could assign them to treatment and control. But the Facebook network is a little bit more like a giant hairball than that. So there are some points of division, but um, often at the country level, at a very large scale. Um, so how, how do we how do we cope with that? So I'm not going to go into the details of how we do that. There's a we have a paper on the archive. Uh, it's a manuscript on on these methods um, that you can check out. Uh, but basically, the idea is to think about what if we what if we try to to cut through this network in some way to create more people who are surrounded by people who are having the same experience as them and anticipate what would happen under this situation of everyone being in treatment versus everyone being in control. Now, I'll say you probably don't want just one cut. Because say you're working with the United States and you say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna cut the United States in half. Well, okay, if your graph cutting algorithm works correctly, you'll cut it down the Mississippi and the, you know, the East Coast will be in treatment and the West Coast will be in control or the other way around. And somehow that maybe you don't have a large enough effective sample size. You've only really randomized two pieces. So you want a lot, a lot more clusters than that. Um, so we, we do some, a lot of graph cutting. Um, you have to kind of figure out, um, basically the idea is you know, to partition the network into pieces and then randomly assign the pieces themselves to treatment and control. So you know, we have to figure out then how we do go about cutting this giant hairball, right? I mean, it's basically, this is a global network that you have to slice up into lots of these little pieces to randomize. And so this involves using a lot of uh, uh, scalable, uh, parallelizable uh, graph partitioning methods that I won't discuss a lot, but um, and I'll, I'm going to skip through. But an example of, of how we can use this is, so this is a portion of the Facebook homepage uh, that says, what's on your mind in, in the box where you post your status update? And... Um, on Thanksgiving Day, we've actually done a series of experiments in this way, but this is from 2012. Um, we partitioned the United States into 6,400 clusters using balanced label propagation, and then assigned some of the clusters to the control prompt of what's on your mind, and some to the thankful prompt of what are you thankful for. And actually, because we did this partitioning, we were able to get more people who have like friends in the same condition as them. So if you have the thankful prompt, you're more likely to have all 10 of your friends also in the thankful prompt. If you're in the control prompt, more of your friends are likely to be in the control prompt as well. So we sort of successfully push people into these more surrounded environments of having uh, you know, a homogenous local experience. Um, and then this allows us to have more data for estimating what would happen under this extreme case of everyone having the thankful prompt versus everyone having the control prompt. So here, we're looking at the probability of an individual posting a thankful status update on Thanksgiving 2012 uh, as a function of whether they themselves have the thankful prompt or the control prompt, the thankful prompt and the control prompt, and how many of their friends also have the, have the thankful prompt. And so, you know, we might want to con contrast these sort of extreme conditions. And by doing this graph cluster randomization, we've moved more people into these extreme conditions. So. Um, that's kind of all I wanted pr to present, but the general idea is that um, I think peer effects are probably the most central idea to the social sciences. They're, they're what make the social sciences social, um, and they're, they're really hard to learn about. And we try to do that through a lot of different methods, from the kind of observational analysis that I talked about with the, the Snopes, to running these sort of simple, mi minute experiments where you change a single channel by which uh, peer effects occur, to trying to do this sort of graph cluster randomization so people are almost in alternate universes 
where they and their and their local network are having the, the same kind of experience. So thanks.